Anton is, I actually don't need to introduce him here, he's, he's much better known in Frontic than I am. Um, but he's our current uh, regional leader as well, he's a wonderful um, leader for, for our uh, group of churches here in the, in the Winelands, um, and he's also been a, a personal friend for many years, um, and not just a friend, but a, a leader and mentor to me. Uh, my first small group that I joined in Shofar was, was Anton's small group, and we were wild. Um, <laughs> I won't go into all those stories, but man, that, those guys could worship and pray. Um, but, uh, you know, we often say in jest, you know, if, if Shofar had a Chuck Norris, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it would be uh, Anton Mayberg. So we sometimes he's referred to as Chucky Mayberg in Shofar circles. And uh, we sometimes say, Chuck, Chuck Norris is only afraid of one person on this planet, and that's uh, Anton Mayberg. Um, he's, he's really one of the most fearless guys, just in the natural and in the spirit that I, that I know. Man, I have to tell them the story of your bull riding episode. Um, I, did I already share that, that story? Man, I've I got to tell you about this. So it's, I think it's just before Convergence, Anton... Uh, had a kind of a kind of a, he misstepped and he fell and he kind of cracked the bone in his wrist or, or something like that and his his arm is strapped up and we have the pastor summit here, I think a week later, and uh, they they try and organise some entertainment for us now and again, and uh, they had have you seen these 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 fake bull riding things that they set up with these these pillow or these you know protective cushions around but I thought ah oh, you know how fast can this thing go. Um, but uh, the next day when you wake up and every muscle in your body is aching and stiff and sore, then you just realize, you know, that bull was throwing off grown men here in the garden like, like nobody's business. And we all thought, well, there's no way Anton's going to try. He's got a broken hand. I think Anton, I don't know. I think Andres won that night, but you might have come second with a broken hand. You know, that's just, just to give you a sense of how tough this guy is. He's uh, always up for the challenge. Um, but having said that, he's got one of the biggest hearts that I know. Um, and um, he's often, when he's ministering, he's, you know, he's in tears. So just as tough as he is, his heart is just so soft. And it's rare that you find a, a strong leader like this who's, whose heart is soft be, before God as well. Um, and I think that's why God can use him so powerfully. So it's a wonderful privilege to have you here this morning. Anton, bless you. Let's welcome him. Thanks, Richard. After that intro, I need some water. <coughs> yeah, I think um, competitiveness is in my genes too. So uh, that's where the bull riding thing comes from. Um, it's wonderful to be with you this morning, and I just sense that God wants to move mightily in our midst today. Um, I've been in prayer for this morning, and, you know, I considered a number of things um, to preach on. I initially thought, you know, I would be preaching a message on reaching out and reaching out to your neighbor and loving your neighbor as you love yourself, and I thought about preaching a message pertaining to the events of this week, and uh, I'll leave that for you in prayer. Um, but the Lord directed me to a different message that may apply in some parts to the season we are in, or the turmoil that Richard was speaking about. Um, but most of it applies to us in times, different times and parts of our lives. Before I get into the message, though, uh, just a few thoughts in terms of the turmoil that we, we are entering in. I think Richard and Uncle Angus have said what needs to be said. Uh, but I just want to sort of echo th four thoughts. The first one is pray, and that's already been said. You know, what do we need to do? The first thing is pray, and pray for our country, pray for the farmers, pray for not only the farmers, but everyone, all the families that are in need of healing, those who've lost somebody, pray against the violence, uh, but also pray for ourselves. 
Say, Lord, what do I need to do? What do I need to say? How do I need to respond to this? And you ask those questions before you ask it in the group. Ask it to God. You know, even before you arrive at your discussion group or before you arrive at, at Wednesday's cell group and you're going to have a discussion on that, pray and say, Lord, teach me, show me, speak to me. And the second thing is forgiveness. You know, this is a time to also just consider forgiveness afresh. Um, and thirdly is to support. Support the families that you get in touch with. Pray and say, Lord, it, shouldn't I maybe go and visit this? You know, we don't want to enforce ourselves on anybody um, and to enforce ourselves to sort of make ourselves look good. That's not the point. But wherever we encounter pain and wherever we can help or wherever we can pray together or whether we can arrange something, let us support wherever we can. And then finally, I want to caution and say, in prayerfully measure your actions. And that is what Uncle Angus was saying. He's saying, listen, guys, don't take up arms. Now, Richard was, was saying, people are asking the question, you know, what does it help if a million people goes to Bloemfontein and pray, and it, and it looks like the, the murders is just not stopping. It looks like the drought in, in the Western Cape is just not clearing up. Um, now, my answer to that is imagine a million people did not go to Bloemfontein and they all grabbed their guns now. What would have happened then? I think God prepared our hearts in Bloemfontein so that we are ready for what we are in now. Because maybe I just have a holy friends on Facebook, but I haven't seen anybody on Facebook saying, let's put up our guns and now go, go look for somebody to shoot. All the video clips I've seen is people saying, let's not take up arms, but let us firstly come to God in prayer. And those who are arranging some kind of protest is doing it peacefully. And that is my encouragement to you this morning as well. You know, Some might be wearing black T-shirts tomorrow, some not. That's up to you. Uh, some might be putting their tractors on the end one and others might not. But whatever you do, do it peacefully. And not in judgment or in condemnation or out of anger and hatred. You know, but rather by conviction to, to, to cause a change to come. But again, do all things prayerfully. You know, it's so easy for politicians to hijack moments like these. It's so easy to be swept up in the hype and to be moved by the spirit of, of anger and resentment instead of the Spirit of God. And um, that's all I wanted to say about that for now. You can pray about it in the week, and I'm sure as a church you'll have discussions. But we must know, as Uncle Angus has said, that we are not the only ones that are feeling the pain. You know, you know we... The recent farm matter that happened, yes, close by, but there's other places in other parts of the country where it's been much worse. And there's places which, where murders take place not in the farms, but in the townships, in the, in, in the cities, in, everywhere it's happening. It's not just one specific demographic of people. And it's also not only South Africa. It's also not only South Africa. And this morning as I'm going to be preaching, I'll touch on one or two things. But I tell you, uh, my heart was stirred you know, when I saw these things on the Facebook. But my heart was also stirred when I saw more than a million families having to run for their lives in Syria. My heart was stirred. And that was how many years ago? That's two years ago already, maybe longer. You know, that... that Half a million people were sitting in the desert without food and water with the Taliban and the, not the Taliban, the, the militia guys, Islam, uh, ISIS and those guys were trying to come and, and murder as many as they could. They were hiding in the mountains with children, two, three years old, and babies and people dying al along the road and, and, and no government sending in troops or the troops that are going in as handfuls, like 50 or 100, you know, but there's a half a million people that were destitute, that were running around in desperate times. And I don't think that all of them are still okay now. I think a lot of people in Syria and surrounding areas are still suffering greatly as we speak. And it's not only Syria. There are other countries in the Middle East and in North Africa and communities even in Nigeria 
and some parts in Kenya where there's this great brutality, where there is Islamic militant militias. Imagine you a, a little village and 300 young ladies is stolen away to become sex slaves. Imagine the pain of a community like that. So what I'm trying to say is the pain in this world is great, and it's not only ours. That doesn't mean we shouldn't feel and sympathize with the pain that is close to us. It doesn't mean when we say, Ugh, it happens everywhere, don't let this bother you. No, 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 let everything bother you rather. Let us rather feel the pain of everyone that, whose pain that we need to feel, because God feels the pain of everyone. God is the one who wants to intervene, and he is looking for godly men and women to rise up to do the wonderful things that some of the NGOs are doing to intervene, to help, to, to bring food assistance, or whatever intervention God may lead one to do. Let me pray. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you anoint my mouth as I speak today. I pray your blessing upon this congregation and that you do your work in our midst today. In Jesus' name. My, my message today is entitled Endurance. Here and there we, we might hopefully have a, a light moment or two, but it is sort of a serious mo sermon. And endurance is some, one of those kind of things that we don't really want to talk about. Who of you did uh, middle distances at school or high school or cross-country running? Okay. Right. Anybody did some rugby, hockey, those kind of things? And the coach, if they say, today we're going to do stamina. Do you remember those announcements by the sports coaches? Today it's stamina, bolter. We're going to go up the hills today. <laughs> and it's up one, up the hill, up and then down, and up the hill and down, or it's stairs. And you run those stairs, and it, you feel like you want to throw up. I did middle distances. So, so I know the feeling, where, you know, when they talk about endurance and endurance races and, and building up stamina, the thought is not always great if you're unfit. If, if you're already a seasoned marathon runner, you say, oh, no, but I love that. But, but, but if you do like two kilometers, if that's sort of your distance and the coach is saying, okay, we're going to go for 10, mm, sometimes we feel it. And so today we might not be overly eager as I announce my topic for the day, but you know, these sports events that we do and the little things in life where we learn endurance is there to coach us in life as we mature so that when the, the bigger stuff comes, we are stronger. I love that the praise and worship this morning. It just so confirmed the message that I have in my heart with you. Our God is stronger, amen? He is stronger, He is stronger. He comforts, He's our comforter. Now, I remember, you know, when I just reached high school and I went to the, for the first training at, at the cross-country team, and they said, okay, now we're going to run. And, and you know, um, instead of the normal two kilometers I was used to, they're saying, okay, we're going to go for six or seven or something. And I was running, 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 and it's a big group, and there's a, there's a lady teacher running with us. And, you know, you know you, I'm a boy, not a man yet, but still, you know, I don't want the teacher to beat me. And I remember my lungs were like flapping, man. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> and then after a while, you know, I had that, um, what do you call it, stitch, multsteak, yeah. And so, you know, I was feeling this pain, feeling this pain, and I was thinking this is going to be my excuse to take a break. So I went to the teacher and I said, listen, you know, running next to her, can I, can I take a break? She says, no, just keep running, it'll go away. <laughs> the only way to get rid of it is to keep on running. And to breathe deeper from your tummy in. And I thought, oh, goodness me, eh? <laughs> I had a coach, you know, that, uh, not her, but another guy who was even better. And, and, you know, we would be running around circles around the track, laps around the track. And then you come to a point where you want to throw up. And you go, coach, 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 I want to throw up. And he says, yeah, do it there. And then you keep on running. <laughs> no sympathy there. <laughs> and that helped because when you're in that race and you, you're sort of in that life and death situation, not real life and death, but if you're at school and the sports and it's like make or break and you feel like you want to give up and you feel like you want to throw up, then you know, now I'm going to push through. 
And sometimes, not only through sports, but other things, we learn to endure. And we will need endurance when things happen in our lives. And uh, the children's movie, Finding Nemo, did you all see that? And then uh, what was one of the famous songs that Dory sang? Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. <laughs> I've seen that movie a number of times, as you may have guessed. And, and, and sometimes if you're going through the jellyfish that sting and you just have to just keep swimming, keep it light, keep it focused, but just keep swimming in life. So let us jump into some scriptures. I'm going to read quite a num number of scriptures today. Second uh, Corinthians 1 from verse 3 to 11. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. We're going to come back to this introduction. The God, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that you, are, you share in our sufferings, and you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, for in the affliction we experience, for of the affliction we experience in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and He will deliver us. On Him we have set our hope that He will deliver us again. You also must help us by praying, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessings granted us through the prayers of many. I'm just going to stop there. So Paul is talking about struggles and, and, and suffering, and he's saying, listen guys, we have a hope. And we also have hope for you, even though you are not going through the exact same sufferings, but there are some similar sufferings that you are suffering for the name of Christ, for the sake of the gospel. And because you are also suffering as we are suffering, we know that God will comfort you as He's comforted us. And, and also the comfort with which He comforts us, we can also comfort you, and you will be able to comfort others as well. In this, in other words, He's saying, I actually have hope for you that you are suffering. If you were not suffering, he says, I might not have that much hope for you, by default, in other words. It is because you are suffering and we are suffering that we can build up something that will actually lead us to stand strong and keep on staying stronger. But listen to what Paul says. It says, he says we felt like dying, utterly burdened beyond our strength, that we despaired of life itself. Who of you have been in that place where you feel like you, you've gone beyond breaking point? Where, where you, you, you passed the breaking point already. It's not like you're being stretched and stretched and stretched. You already passed the breaking point. Like, now it just feels like a death sentence. Has anybody ever felt like that? I have. I have felt like that a number of times. And what he's essentially saying, he's saying, listen, this is not a joke. He's saying, this is not a sentimental thought I'm sharing with you. Because sometimes we, we can get very sentimental as Christians. Have you noticed? You know, somebody goes through a tough time and saying, I'll be praying for you, brother. Um, and that's sort of another way of the Christian way of saying, good luck. I hope you make it. Yeah, have, you, have you noticed, you know, sometimes people ask you to do something you don't really want to do and you answer, I'll pray about that. Are you really going to pray about that? No, it's just a means of saying, I'm not really going to do it. 
We, we have these sentimental answers that we sometimes give. And then Paul is saying, guys, listen, this is not a joke. We need to take this seriously. And we might, must also take the words coming from, or listen to the words by looking at who it comes from. This is the same guy that after being whipped with the cuts, they had seven strings, seven whips with hooks and wires and pieces of glass on it, 39 hits like that, and pulling the skin and flesh off his back um, and ripping off the muscles so that you could see his lungs through the bones of his rib cage. You know, that, that, is, that is the suffering he suffered five times, but on one occasion he was with Silas and they were in prison, and what did they do? They sang songs, praise and worship songs in the middle of the night. So this is a guy that really knows suffering and even in the midst of it, how to overcome by praise and worshiping God. And yet he says, I have suffered beyond what I can bear. In other words, worse than that time where he was singing. Worse than that time he suffered other times. So this is not a guy that doesn't know how to handle pain. He knows how to handle pain. He knows how to overcome. And even he says, listen, sometimes I have been pushed beyond what I can be. And yet, God is with me. Yet, God has not forsaken me. Yet, I have a hope eternal. Paul, in the beginning of the scripture, he introduces God and he, he highlights two characteristics. He says, further, first of all, he is the father of mercies and he is the God of all comfort. In other words, when one goes through those trial, troubling times and challenging times, you sometimes need the mercy. And you're saying, God, just have mercy on me. Just, just bring some pain relief. Help me out of this pain. And God says, I will have mercy. At another time, God speaks to Paul and he says, my grace is sufficient for you when he had that thorn in the flesh, whatever that may have been. But God says to him, my grace is sufficient for you, but grace is God's unmerited favor, but God is also God of mercy. And he says, listen, I will help you and I will actually assist you through being merciful to you and helping you to be merciful to others. And he is the God of all comfort. So if you are looking for mercy, if you are looking for comfort, Look to God. When we are crying out, say, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. God is the one who brings that. Who of you know that, that children's game? It's called mercy. <laughs> Do you know that one? Will you st just stand quickly, Richard. Will you stand? You hold like this, and then you have to force like that. And, and then you keep going. Until somebody says mercy, and that's when you give up. Hmm? <laughs> so if you're looking for mercy, cry out to God and don't play the game. <laughs> and then he says, listen, I want you to remember that Jesus has suffered so that he can understand our suffering, but also that he can comfort us with the comfort that the Father and the Holy Spirit has comforted him with. And that we can comfort others at the same time. We endure so that we can comfort others. Now, I first of all want to say, John chapter 10 verse 10 says, The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. So where does death and destruction, all of these things come from? It comes from Satan. It does not come from God. Okay, and we need to be clear about that. So when he's saying you are suffering so you can help others, it's not God who's, who's done something terrible to you so that you may do something good. Okay, that's not the theology here. And then also in Romans chapter 8 from verse 26 to 28. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So let's just talk this thing through for a moment. God is saying 
that when you suffer and when you have pain and when you are being comforted, it is so that you can also comfort others who are suffering. But the scripture says that it is not God that has inflicted you. He's not punishing you. He's not striking you. It, we are living in a fallen world. We're living in a world where there's sickness and there's storms and there's, there's, there's earthquakes and all sorts of things because of the will of man. God has allowed the free will of man, and because of that free will that we have, Adam and Eve made the decision to sin, and therefore knowing right from wrong has entered this globe, and because we know how to do wrong, people are doing wrong. And so people will murder, people will steal, people will lie, people will cause, commit adultery. These things will take place. And other people will suffer. With sin comes death. Many forms of death, many forms of suffering will come from that. So it's not God that has caused anybody to be murdered or anybody to be raped. It is men and women in sin that are doing that. And all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us can say, I am, without sin. Even the smallest of sins is going to lead us to Romans 6.26. that says, for the wages of sin is death. Romans 3.23, sorry, not 26. But then, when we look at this, this suffering that we have, then he says, listen, I make all things work together for good. For those who love me. Again, the context of saying that is, listen guys, it's not about causing something negative to happen. But when it happens, God says, I can take something and make something terrible and do something good. I was watching the Facebook messages and video clips this week. Um, and here at Club Mits, where one of the three farm murders happened, there was three on one day in different towns. Um, this was just one of three. And I saw that the, uh, the, the buckies and the vehicles lined up next to the road, and they long lines. And then I saw one farmer standing on the back of a bucky, and he was preaching. And he was praying, and he was leading people to Christ who committed their lives to Jesus. And I was saying, well, Satan surely didn't plan that. Satan planned for the destruction and for pain and for anger and for anguish. But God has taken even in that pain and in that anguish, he's raised someone up to turn this negative situation for the better. God is the God who changes the terrible into the mighty and the wonderful. I remember my dad passed away in 2009, and, and my mom was in grief for some time, but didn't really deal with it. And so I think pro approximately two years later, she, she heard about a ministry called Grief Share. And it's sort of an interdominational thing, and, and you could go there, and I think it's about 12 weeks or something like that, where you come and there's this smaller, uh, you know, like, almost like a cell group, but not a cell group, it's just a grief group. And you would speak about your grief, and there would be some people that would then actually minister to you and help you to deal with the grief and the pain that you've gone through. And it's like people similar who's lost somebody, uh, whether it's be a husband or a wife or a child or whomever you've lost, that you can go to that grief share. And so she went through it, I think, for 12 weeks. And by the end of it, they said, but listen, this program is in fact a 24-week program. The first 12 weeks you are here to receive, and the second 12 weeks you are here to give. And your giving is part of your own healing. In other words, your program is not finished until you finish the 24 weeks. So just coming for your first 12 weeks and saying, well, let's talk about me and my pain and my grief, that is not the fullness of your own healing. The fullness of your own healing is actually going to manifest when you start to give to others. Has anybody experienced that? That as, as you share with others about your pain, you actually receive more healing yourself, even though you already have been healed? That, again, makes me think of the people in Syria. And for us who's been suffering and those who have been affected, say, but let me also think about how am I going to 
comfort others with the comfort that I have received. Then Apostle Paul writes and he says, pray for us who are in peril. Now, at other times, that's not the only time where he says pray for us, but he says pray for us who are in peril. And sometimes we don't want to, to acknowledge that we need prayer. Because spiritual pride in the charismatic circles, especially Pentecostal circles, is something that says, if I admit I need prayer, it means I lack faith and I'm somehow not an overcomer. It's like subconsciously we think I'm supposed to overcome by myself in the name of Jesus and by faith in his name. And so if I'm not overcoming a certain sin or a certain uh, challenge or a certain pain or obstacle, then, then I... I I really can't ask for somebody to pray with me. But I, I want us this morning to lay that down, and after this message, we're going to be praying together. And if you have some pain that you've been carrying for a while, why don't you ask someone to pray with you today? If there's some weeds, the sins, which Rosita has been speaking about, that is standing in your way, standing between you and God, why don't you... Let someone pray with you today. The Bible says in James 5, 16, Confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. But if you don't confess and then pray together, there won't be that healing. Yes, we can repent by ourselves and we can pray by ourselves, but I tell you, there is more power when two people come together in agreement when we pray for one another. So that means we must pray for one another and ask for prayer without fear. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10 from verse 34 to 39. For you had compassion on those in prison and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Since you knew that you yourselves had a better position and an abiding one. Therefore do not throw away your confidence which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Quite a powerful scripture. It starts out by saying, you are joyful, joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Wow. That's like coming home after the holidays and your house has been cleaned out and somebody's stolen everything. And you say, Hallelujah! No, that's not what we say, hey. Now, if they only stole your old bicycle and you've got insurance, you're going to get a new one, then you might say hallelujah. <laughs> but if you don't have insurance and you get there and your house has been cleaned out, if you're living in Syria and you and your entire village have had to leave your houses and all the things you have inherited for, for 2,000 years, the oldest Christian communities come from Syria. If you had to leave your church and the books and the history and, and everything that was precious to you, everything that was cement, sentimental to you, all your photographs, nothing on a little memory stick in your pocket, no videos, no nothing, everything, you, you're running with the clothes on your body, 500,000, a million people running like that, they've lost everything. That doesn't sound like the time to shout hallelujah. And yet he says, but you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better position and an abiding one. What is that better position? It is Christ. It is eternal life with Christ, which means that is better. Even though I may lose my physical things, even though I may lose my house and my, my environment and the place where I grew up in, yet I can still know that in Christ I have something that no one can take away from me. I have an eternal love that no one can take away from me. Even though my friends and family may reject me and even try to kill me in certain places of the world, I know that my God is with me. 
That is why when God spoke to Abraham, he said to him, I, Abraham, I am your exceedingly great reward. God gives himself to Abraham, and that is what we have. We are sons and daughters of Abraham. Then he says, don't throw away your confidence. Confidence is something, if we look at this scripture, that we can actually throw away. We have a confidence, and then we sort of just, oh, what, what, what hope is there? What, what, why should I feel happy about this? What? And you just throw away your confidence, your confidence in Christ. But he says, you have need of endurance. You need that endurance. In other words, you need to, by choice, say, I'm going to be walking in endurance. Then he talks about shrinking back. When challenges come, when temptations come, when, when the devil comes to you, shrinking back. And he says, listen, but my righteous one shall live by faith. In other words, faith in who? Faith in Christ, the Savior. Faith in, in God as my Father. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back. That is my encouragement to you today, that we encourage one another and say, hey, say, say this. See us normally does the say to your neighbor thing, but let's, let's do that. Say to your neighbor, we are not of those who shrink back. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. That's not a scripture you hear often in sermons, do you? You have not yet resisted sin and temptation to the point of shedding your blood. We're not talking about persecution yet. Persecution is the first bit. But we're also talking about sin. And the weeds that Rosita was talking about, he's saying, listen, you need to lay aside every weight and every sin which clings so closely. It's like an athlete that, that's wanting to train and wanting to run the race, but you have like 10 weights on your shoulders and you have rubber straps around your, your, your legs. Have you seen the, the guys doing that? You know? And you're trying to, to run the race like that. It's fine for exercises, but if you want to enter the race like that, you've got to lay it aside. The people who cycle try to get their bicycle as light as possible. Are there any cyclists in the room? You know what I'm talking about? You pay like 10,000 rand extra to save like 50 grams on your bicycle. But then you're five kilograms overweight, and somehow you haven't figured out that you can save money by losing weight. Just think about that for a moment. <laughs> He's saying, lay aside every weight and every sin if you want to endure. If you want to run the race to endurance. The further you run, the less weight you have. Have you seen those middle distance runners, those comrades runners? They thin. They light. And they don't carry a, like a uh, King Judah suit or something, you know. The guys with the King Judah suits and the, the, the whatever suits, you know, they sort of come the last hour that you see them coming in through the commerce, if they do make it. So we need to lay aside these things and come to a point where we're saying, I am willing to resist my sins even to the point of bloodshed. That doesn't mean you need to go cut yourself or lacerate yourself. It just means that sometimes... And whatever circumstance it may be, that we need to resist it so heavily that even if someone might actually put a gun to your head or friends might actually fight with you to bloodshed, saying, if you don't sin with us, if you don't, are not part of this drug deal, or if you're not going to help us rape this girl, then we are going to, to do something to you too. 
Now, I'm using extreme examples, but when Paul is saying, listen, you have not yet resisted unto bloodshed, he's saying, listen, you don't have an excuse. And that is why the Bible says you must hate sin. We, you and I, we have to hate sin because if we don't hate it, we will love it. Our natural instinct is to love it. That's why we do it. Naturally, we will say all kinds of things to justify it to ourselves. That includes me because I'm also a sinner. But the Lord is saying to us today, listen, you need to come to a point where you need to hate that sin. Because that sin is weighing you down. And it's causing destruction in your life. And when you start to see the destruction for what it is, then you'll start to hate it. The more you see the destruction, the more you will hate it. The more you enjoy the freedom of running without that sin, the more you will say, I'd never want that again. He also says, look unto Jesus as the author and finisher, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So Jesus looked at the cross. He knew that if I go through this cross, then salvation is going to come to mankind. There was an end goal that made him persevere. I stood next to Christelle five times holding her hand while she gave birth. And... Um, and all time, all five times, it was natural. And the first one was, was the most painful of all because she uh, wasn't dilating and it was, had that oxytocin extra drip thing that makes you contract the most violent contractions without an epidural. And, and I could see the pain that she was going through for 36 hours. But there was joy at the end of it. To say, I'm going to go through this because there's joy at the end of my pain. There's joy at the end of my suffering. And he says, now look unto Jesus who did that and do the same. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Now, coming back to athletics and sports, when we're running the race, you know, when you have grade ones running for the first time, what's the first thing you teach them? Stay in your lane. Do they stay in their lanes? No, they don't. They run crisscross everywhere. They don't stay in their lanes. Why? Because they're running, looking at the friend, and then they're looking at this friend. And which, depending on whichever direction they're looking at, that's the direction that they're running in. My father taught me, he said, Anton, when you're driving, put your eyes on the road because your hands naturally follow your eyes. A tennis coach will tell you the same thing. Keep your eye on the ball and your hand will follow your eye. Hand-eye coordination. Who of you have ever cycled on a bicycle? Somebody called you, you looked back, and then suddenly you made a connection with a tree. Anybody experienced that? Depending on which side you were looking at, that's the the side where you were turning from. That's why he said, listen, don't look at these other things. Look unto Jesus. Don't look to the left or the right. Don't look at the circumstances because then you're going to go into that direction. Don't look at the anger and the frustrations and the pain because then you're going to be sidetracked in that direction. Whichever thing takes your eyes off Jesus, that's where you will be pulled into automatically. Which is why he says, listen, and this time look unto Jesus, no one else. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 3 to 11. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love by truthful speech and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken to you freely, Corinthians, our heart is wide open. 
He's talking about coming in the opposite spirit, amongst other things. And he's saying, listen, people say that we were not known and yet we were known. We were dying and behold, we were alive. We were punished yet we were not killed. And he's having these, these opposites and he's saying, guys, our hearts are wide open for you. And when these things happen, do not take it personally. Because he's talking about people saying, saying we were treated as imposters and yet we were true. In other words, we were treated unfairly as if an imposter, someone who doesn't belong. As unknown yet well known. In other words, that people don't recognize the relationships that we have. Has anybody felt like the people you that really know you act as if they don't? And yet he says, Listen, don't take this personally, but keep your heart wide open. I'm going to close with the second last scripture. Romans five is one to five. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access to faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is a very well-known scripture, one of those that we also don't really like to read for bedtime stories. Yet we need it because he's speaking about it. He says, suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character. Now let's talk about sports again. Um, oftentimes, have you heard after the match, a rugby coach would say, the boys really showed some character today. Have you heard that before? Hmm. What do they mean by that? It can be good or bad, depending on who won or who lost. But typically, if you're on the winning side, it would mean that you were five minutes to full time, you were 15 points behind. And instead of just saying, okay, we've lost already, there's five minutes left, there's no chance in hell that we're actually going to win this thing, so let's just sort of play the five minutes out. No, no, the boys with the character are the ones who says, we're going to keep on playing because we can do this. I mean, the All Blacks have done it to us. I think there was once we were like 20 points ahead with five minutes to go and they still beat us. <laughs> They showed some character. But sometimes our boys have also shown some character. And then sometimes, you know, the All Blacks would be coming at us and they just need that one try. And they're coming and they're coming and it's phase after phase after phase. And they just, the Springboks just keep them out and keep them out and keep them out. And it's tackle after tackle after tackle after tackle. And eventually we win the game because of character in defense or attack. In defense and attack, you're going to need character in life. In life, to, to, to attack and, and, and get that victory, you're going to need character. In defense, you're going to need that character, and that character comes through suffering. That has led to endurance, and that endurance has strengthened you to show character when the time comes. Secondly, it says that character produces hope. Hope influences our state of mind which again influence our state of being. Let me say that again. So hope influences your state of mind, and your state of mind influences your state of being. So if you're standing again under the poles of the rugby game, and you are far behind, the guys have just scored against you, and you say, guys, this is a lost game, then you're going to act and play like people that are not going to be winning. Your, your actions will be determined by your state of mind. And your state of mind is determined by whether you have hope or not. Sometimes you would hear sports teams say, we are really in a good space. Have you heard that line? We need to be in a good space, and good space comes from hope. But our hope is not based on the facts. In other words, if we have a victory, if you, you get a, a, a Christmas bonus at the end of the year, anybody looking forward to a Christmas bonus? You know, when that Christmas bonus lands there in your, in your bank account, then suddenly there's hope, hey? Hope that we're going to have a good Christmas. 
and we sing the songs. You know, I'm not going to sing one now, but because suddenly there's hope. But if you only have hope when there's success or breakthrough, you're not going to have that eternal hope. We are holding on to an eternal hope that is there. The Bible speaks of, of um, peace that surpasses all understanding, meaning you have peace when you're not supposed to have peace, meaning you have hope when there's no indication for hope. Hope should not be based in facts only, but hope shall be there in the fact that I have hope in my God. Christelle and I are in situations from time to time where we don't know what decisions to make. We don't know what life decisions to make. We don't know what financial decisions to make. We don't have the answers. And then we say, God, we don't know, but you know, and therefore we will trust in you. Many people are asking questions now concerning this farmer thing. And say, what shall we do? Well, go and ask God. Have our hope in him. And it says, do not discard our hope. I want to say to you that, that when so someone has lost hope, that's almost like losing everything. But the truth is, hope is never fully lost. Even if you fail your matric exams and you have to do matric again, even if you fail at university, even if your business goes bankrupt, hope is never really lost. You can always pick it up again. It's like this cap. You can lose it. And then you can look at it and you can walk away from it or you can pick it up and you can take it back. And today you and I have a choice of whether we're going to pick up hope. The Bible says hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. In other words, if we hope and we hope and we hope and it's like nothing happens, but yet we need endurance to keep on hoping. Otherwise we will let it go. I've shared this story with you many years ago, but let me refresh your memories. I moved school from Randburg to Paul um, in the second semester, or this, uh, the, no, the second term, rather, of my standard nine year, grade 11. And as you know, grade 11 and 12 you do together to, to get your exams. And those days the curriculum were different. It was more difficult. So I essentially arrived one term behind, one full term behind. My marks fell from 70-something to like 30-something in certain subjects, especially science and maths, because I was just so far behind. And maths is not the kind of thing you can just thumb suck. Either you know it or you don't know it. And so my, my maths fell from 34% to 22% to 14%. Now, in Randburg, I had a friend that whenever he failed a subject, he burst out laughing. And I thought, this guy's crazy. But I tell you, when I got that 14% on my report, I burst out laughing like you've never heard me laugh. It's that deep belly laugh. And later on, it's when I phoned my dad, because, you know, you always fear the phone call, Dad, this is my mark, you know. When my dad heard 14%, he had the same reaction, burst out laughing. <laughs> but I want to tell you about my laugh from the school to the hostel. It's like 150 meters uphill, you know, for the conference now where we're at. I was up hills, and I was walking, and I was laughing and laughing and laughing, and just keep on laughing and laughing and laughing. Why? I was laughing, not at myself. I was laughing at the pathetic mark to begin with. That's why my dad also laughed. But the deep belly laugh came from the fact that I said, Satan, you have nothing in me. Even, because that was like the third term, uh, of, of standard nine, which is what the universities use to determine whether you accepted to university or not. I said, Satan, even if I fail this year and I have the shame to be in this posh grand school and be one of the, possibly the only guy coming back to do this again, all my friends going to university, I'm not accepted to university, and all the shame and all the embarrassment that goes with that, I said, Lord, even if that happens, I know that you are with me. I know that God loves me, and that is enough. That day, on the steps walking back to the hostel, I had a grandest revelation of God's love for me more than anything else, because I knew that even if I fail and if I have this incredible shame, 
God loves me, and his love is enough. We say these sentimental things, but go and get yourself 14% for a maths exam, and then we talk again about sentimental chatting. I had a real, true revelation of God's love, and that it's enough. And I had a hope. I had a hope that it's okay, and that this failure does not determine who I am. It does not label me. It does not make me a loser. Because in Christ, I am a winner. I am an overcomer. I am not of those who give up. Hallelujah. So, in the next year, I started to study harder. That went to some extra winter school, etc. Long story short, I ended up with matric with 94% for maths. My, from my... Uh, September exam to the final exam, my average lifted with about 15% on all my subjects. My business economics went from 40-something to an A, etc., so I can carry on. Let us put our hope in God. Pick yourself up. Final scripture, then we're going to pray. Romans 15, verse 4 to 7. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. He's saying, guys, if you've lost hope, he says, encouragement comes through the Scriptures. Read the Scriptures again. Read the Scriptures. Read about the victories of the Scriptures and God's faithfulness. And so, in that sense, stir up the hope that is in you. And hold on to the God of endurance and encouragement. God is endurance and encouragement. comes from Him, first and foremostly. Then he says, with one voice, glorify God. I love the worship this morning. Because I could hear we were singing as one voice. And as one voice, no matter what afflictions we may suffer individually, no matter what sins we are entangled with individually, we can come before God and say, Lord, set us free in Jesus' name. Lord, our hope is in you. Not only my hope, but our hope is in Jesus Christ. And then finally he says, therefore, welcome one another. In other words, embrace one another. Have this fellowship with one another to support one another. So I'm going to leave you with that. Many things I've said, I'm not going to recap. We're running out of time. But I'd like you to spend some time in prayer this, after, this morning. So there may be people here that are discouraged, who have lost hope, and you need to pick up hope again. And you need somebody to pray with you to have your hope restored. But before we even pray, I must say that it's up to you to pick it up or to let it be. You need to make that decision. And the people who can pray with you will encourage you in that and and agree with you to turn to the God of hope, the God of encouragement, the one who lifts us up. I don't know what battles you are facing. I'm facing battles. So if you are facing a battle and if you are in that position, we're saying, Lord, I need my hope restored. I need my faith restored. I need endurance. And I want you to come and be prayed for. Secondly, if there are things that are weighing you down, whether it is burdens that you should let go of, things like unforgiveness, or whether it's hurt or pain that are burdens that's weighing you down, or whether it is sins that are entangling you, you need to break with that. And we need to get somebody to pray with you today. So in a moment when we call people to come to the front, I want the other call facilitators, the elders and cell leaders, if you are here, to come and assist me and afterwards pray for one another as well. Because you too may need prayer. And whenever somebody comes to the front, just ask the question, 
what can I pray for? In other words, what have you come for? Is it a burden that you want to let go of? Is it a sin you want to let go of? Or are you just wanting God to restore hope? And let's pray accordingly by the Spirit of God. Before we get into this prayer, I want to ask the question I always ask. Is there someone in this room that are not yet connected to Jesus Christ? Because if you are not born again yet, which means you have repented of all your sins, your sinful life, and you've turned away, and you said, I'm going to follow Jesus, and I will do His will. I repent of my sins, and I place my faith in Jesus Christ. I commit to love God my Father with my whole heart, my whole soul, my whole mind, and all my strength. I accept the price that Jesus has paid for me by faith. And the fact that I accept him as my Lord, I bow before his will, and I accept him as my Savior. Lord and Savior. That is how we become born again or enter into the new covenant with God, that covenant of love, a relationship. And if you don't have that, you don't really have hope. Because our eternal hope lies in Christ that we are in relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. And without the Father and without Jesus through whom we, we can get to Him, He's the only way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. If we don't have that, our hope will be normal human hope. We're not going to ever enter into the supernatural hope. We're not going to get into that enduring, everlasting, eternal hope. It only comes through Jesus. So my question this morning is, is there anyone in this room that says, I don't know Jesus. I've not yet committed my life to Jesus. And today I want to do that. Today is my day to say, Lord Jesus, take my life. I repent of my, my sins and I choose to follow you. If that is you, just raise your hand wherever you are. Is there anybody like that? Nobody. If you wanted to raise your hand, but you're just you know, shy to, to raise your hand, you're welcome to come to me or to Pastor Richard afterwards or to Mojalefa or one of the elders and just speak to them and say, listen, I actually want to commit my life to, to Jesus. But as church members, I will say to you what I always say when I ask this invitation, is I will always make this invitation. And whenever you come to church, you need to think about the chair that is open next to you. The person that was supposed to respond to this altar call. And don't think about it quarter past eight next Sunday. Because that's too late. Don't think about it Saturday night. Think about it now. Right now. Think Who's going to sit next to you next Sunday? Someone that does not know Christ. And every Sunday when you leave church, pray about who you're going to invite next Sunday. Amen? That summarizes the message I wanted to give. Let us pray. Let's stand. Lord, we just want to surrender our country before you once again. The pain and the suffering of the murders that have taken place, not only on the farms, but in other places, in other areas in our country. Lord, we bring before you the pain in Syria, the Middle East, North Africa, and other places where Christians and even non-Christians are suffering and moderate Muslims are being killed and murdered. Lord, we repent of sometimes being callous, being ignorant of just looking the other way when we see the news report of Syria coming up. When we think, well, that's too far away. I can't do anything about that. In the same way that South Africans are calling out for other countries, the international community, to wake up, so the Syrians have been calling to no avail. So those under the influence of the threat of their lives have been calling to no avail. 
But Lord, I pray that you open our eyes. Lord, today we want to open our hearts to the people around us that are suffering, that need encouragement, that need hope. And Lord, that we bring before you today our suffering, our healing that you have given unto us. And there where you are, just surrender to God. Say, Lord, here I am, use me. That God will use the pain that you have experienced in your life. That God will use the suffering that you have experienced in your life to bring healing to others, to bring encouragement to others, to bring hope to others. Just say, Lord, here am I. I surrender my pain. I surrender my healing. I surrender my hope that it may become a hope for someone else. That my suffering may become healing for someone else. If you want to respond to the altar calls for prayer, whether it is that you are down on hope, you feel hopeless, you feel down in the pit of despair and you need hope, and I want you to just come to the front and receive some prayer. If you are entangled through sin or whether you have been weighed down by anger or unforgiveness or bitterness, Whatever that may be, whatever you want to pray for, I want to encourage you to just come to the front and let us pray for one another. Just come quickly.